Genome editing has been going on for a lot longer than you've probably realized. For example, in agriculture, humans intervene to accelerate the rate of editing by practices where we select for more desired properties in plants and animals. In 1927, published in the highly reputable journal Science, H.J. Muller reported on a way of appreciably increasing the rate of changes in genomes with his paper titled artificial transmutation of the gene. 20 years later, Charlotte Orbach in 1947 also reported in the journal Science that you can change genomes using radiation or chemicals. Her paper was titled Chemical Production of Mutations. So by 1947, we realized that we can change genomes. But at this point, the changes are random and we have no way of making targeted changes. Enter Mario Capecchi and colleagues in the 1980s, where they devised gene targeting techniques. Capecchi and his team introduced sequences with desired nucleotides into mice that they hoped would be recombined via homologous recombination homologous recombination. Yep, it is both a mechanism for fixing double-stranded breaks in a gene as well as during meiosis to create genetic diversity by swapping segments of homologous chromosomes passed on by each parent. This work, which earned Kopecky a Nobel Prize in Medicine of Physiology in 2007, involved using a positive and negative selection marker on a vector that contains the changes you wish to introduce. It also needed to be performed in embryonic stem cells. Using this approach, the first knockout mouse was created in 1989. The technique was used in mice for decades, very effectively, but was low in efficiency. What became apparent in those days as Dana Carroll, the genome editing pioneer and guru at whose digital feet I sat to learn all of these fascinating tales, was that if there was a double strand break in the target, the recombination event would happen much more efficiently. So how do we make double stranded break in a targeted manner? Let me introduce you first to zinc fingers. Zinc fingers were first discovered in 1983 with partial structures being solved in, in 1991 and complete structure in 1993. Zinc fingers are proteins known as transcription factors that bind DNA, RNA, proteins or other small molecules. The initial discovery was in the transcription factor of frog eggs where none of these DNA binding proteins containing zinc are arranged. It was subsequently realized that zinc fingers are found not only in frog, in frog eggs, but are found in all plants and animals, where they also function in DNA recognition. Zinc fingers later went on to become a technology for editing DNA. Well, how? Well, Kim Cha and Shadran Sigaran et al. published a paper in 1996 in PNAS where they had realized that a particular restriction enzyme known as FOC1 was promiscuous. Scandalous. This means that while most restriction enzymes are very faithful to a particular sequence and will only cut the DNA sequence where those sequences are present, they found that FOC1 was not rolling that way. Mm -hmm. FOC1's DNA recognition and cleavage domains were physically separable. So Shadra Sigaran's group thought, rightly, that if we can separate FOC1, we can put other recognition domains on it. The recognition domains they chose were zinc fingers, naturally occurring in eukaryotic DNA binding transcription factors as just mentioned. So by designing zinc fingers that target your DNA of interest, you can use FOC1 cleavage domain to cut them and FOC1 will just cut any DNA that you've told it to cut. So by designing zinc fingers that target your DNA of interest, you can include FOC1 cleavage domain to them and FOC1 will cut the DNA. 
the nuclear domain of Folk One has to dimerize. The next technology for making double stranded breaks came in the form of transcription activator like effectors or tail. These are modular proteins that can also read the sequence of bases, so the adenines, the guanines, the thymines, the cytosines in the DNA, they can recognize it. They were discovered in bacteria that infects plants, specifically in xanthomonas bacterial species. In nature, plant bacterial pathogens use these proteins to make plant cells more infectable by sending the proteins to the nucleus of plants and activating relevant genes. Sneaky! Tails, unlike zinc fingers, combined one nucleotide at a time, so they're easier to work with than zinc fingers. Researchers engineer these to allow their use to bind any DNA sequence you want by fusing it once again to the DNA cutting domain of the nuclease folk one to allow targeted DNA editing. The next technology to mention is the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Yay! So today we have the CRISPR-Cas9 system. This system we've become aware of quite recently. In the mid-2000s, several researchers had come across repetitive sequences that are palindromes in bacteria. Clarification, palindromic sequences means that it reads the same from the front as well as if you're reading from the back, it will also be the same sequences. And the repetitive sequences are flanked by unique sequences. Researchers were really puzzled by these. The palindromic sequences meant that those sequences could fold and base pair with itself, resulting in structures that are quite different from other bacterial sequences. The palindromic sequences get transcribed, along with snippets of unique sequences, which were not really understood. Well, to cut a reasonably long story short, they were later understood to be viral sequences that the bacteria would keep if and when it survived an infection from a virus. These sequences became known as clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, or CRISPR for short. And it turns out that it's a form of natural bacterial immune adaptive immune system where small sequence representations of viral genomes are kept. In the bacterial system, these representations of viral sequences get copied to RNA, processed and associated with another RNA molecule called tracer RNA before it can then bind a DNA cutting protein known as CRISPR associated or CAS for short. The most common CAS protein that is used is CAS9, which is obtained from the bacteria Streptococcus pyrogenes. Guided by the viral sequence, Cas proteins can cleave and inactivate viral sequences. We have adopted this technology, this system as a technology in the research community to target specific genomic sequences for studies. Note that the synthetic CRISPR-Cas9 tool that is used in the lab is simplified by linking the tracer RNA with the CRISPR RNA and it's called a single guide RNA or sgRNA for short. So there you have it. There's three technologies or tools you can use to make targeted DNA double-stranded breaks targeted double-stranded breaks in a genome that you wish to edit. Now note, an important point here is that all that you do with these technologies is make double-stranded break. And then you rely on the cell's ability to fix double-stranded break to cause the changes that you want. Now, if the cell uses non-homologous end joining, there are two types of ways your cell can fix double-stranded break. If you look at DNA repair mechanisms, you, can, you experience all sorts of DNA repair and there are dedicated pathways for dealing with that. Now, if the break, if the damage that you sustain is a double-stranded break, you have two mechanisms for fixing it in your cell, in eukaryotic cells. So the two mechanisms are non-homologous end joining or homology-directed repair. And so once you've caused this double-stranded break, you now rely on these two to cause the changes that you, to create changes in the genome that you wish to see. Non-homologous end joining is a panic response, occasionally making mistakes that we rely on to knock out genes. The mistakes are frequently localized, small insertions or deletions. Homology-directed repair, you wish for the cell to, to replace 
a particular gene segment with the gene that you wish for it to do. This repair mechanism happens only at specific points in the cell cycle and it's very difficult to get, so it, uh, the efficiency is much, much lower. Okay, so we have a fairly easy tool thanks to the CRISPR-Cas9 system for editing. Amazing. But Stanley Le Chi had an interesting question while working in Jennifer Doudna's lab. Jennifer Doudna is actually one of the pioneers, the main pioneer of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So while Stanley Le Chi was working in Jennifer's lab, he asked, well, what else can we use this tool for besides cutting DNA? Calytically dead Cas9, or DCAS9 for short, allows you targeted editing at the transcriptional level. This means that the changes you make are not permanent because the change is not in the DNA code itself, as in the genome, but the messenger RNA that will be used to make a protein. Whew. So let's summarize. Zinc fingers fused to FOC1 nucleus allows you to edit sequences at least two to three base pairs at a time. FOC1 fused to transcription activator like proteins tails allows you to edit increments of one base at a time. The CRISPR-Cas system, commonly Cas9, allows you to edit any sequences as long as you tell the CRISPR-associated enzyme, Cas9, or whatever other enzyme that's CRISPR-associated that you have, which sequence to cut using an RNA guide. All the best with your experiments.